Hello there, uh, people. Hey, argumentation class. This video is primarily for you, primarily for my students in my fall 2020 argumentation class, but if you are finding this video, uh, you'll probably find it kind of interesting, I think. We're going to talk about uh, Section 3 of Uses of Argument, Stephen Toolman's book, Uses of Argument, which I don't think I have up uh, in the... Uh, In the thingy. I thought I had it up, but um, yeah, there it is. Uses of argument. All right, now I'm ready for you to see it. But uh, yeah, we have some things to talk about in terms of this book. It's um, it's a very interesting and important book. It might not be that interesting, but it's a pretty important book in the study of argumentation for a lot of reasons. This short video will not be able to begin to cover it, but there's a lot of people writing about Stephen Toolman and a lot of work on him. Uh, Stephen Toolman's ideas are in every single argumentation textbook and composition textbook about argument that is out there. Even books that claim not to be from the perspective of Toolman still cite him. Now, that's a very special... I don't know why I have these on. <clears throat> I'm not even listening to music or anything. I'm just talking to you, special people. Now, the thing about um, uh, Toolman uh, is that he um, he's so incredibly important. Here's his book here. Let's bring this up. Maybe we can make this a little bit more uh, friendly to look at. He wrote this book, Uses of Argument, uh, as, a, as a professor of philosophy. Um, and his idea is just so pervasive. It captured the imagination of American uh, rhetoric professors primarily and some language philosophers, but probably not language philosophers. And here's the reason why. Toolman was responding to the idea that argumentation must be valid in order to be good. Now, what does that mean? It's a specialized philosophical term. You might have heard it in one of your philosophy classes here at St. John's. For an argument to be valid, it means it needs to structurally follow the rules, the rules of being a good argument. And you can look those up in different kinds of books on logic. Um, as you probably realized, uh, most people, when they say, when you're arguing with them, they say, you're not being logical, often aren't relying on logic at all. They're just saying it because you're not agreeing with their preference. Oh, use some logic. Come on, you agree with me. Use some logic. Uh, I, I did. I, I have been. Uh, why aren't you listening to it? Why aren't you agreeing with me? Well, unfortunately, we can't rely on philosophy and logic to do all our work for us. And Toulmin recognized that when he was a philosophy student at Cambridge University. And he was interested in language, philosophy of language, philosophy of argument. He was also studying at a time when in philosophy in Europe primarily, there was a lot of concern. Uh, the 1950s is when this, this book came out, I think, in 58. Uh, when the, the, the greater scope and scale of what the Nazis had done started coming to light and how well supported the Nazi party was by people who were living in Germany at that time, um, it kind of horrified the philosophers. They, they, they thought they, had, they were on the edge of something uh, great. They thought they were doing an excellent job of teaching things like ethics, of teaching people how to reason, how to see through deception and lies, how to see through harmful words and avoid doing horrible things. They thought they had mastered that. And the Nazis are kind of a, a powerful argument against that. So a lot of the attitude in Europe at the time was, well, philosophy has failed humankind. What can we do about this? And Toulmin, along with a lot of other philosophers, was kind of motivated by this too, of like, well, maybe our model and philosophy of validity first is not the best way to teach people how argument works. <clears throat> so he wrote this book, and he's heavily criticized for this book from philosophy. Because this book is an inductive mode of thinking about argument. And that's a good term to start our conversation here. Um on the document. Let me make it a little bigger for you here. I don't think it's big enough. All right. So let's think about these two kinds of reasoning that philosophy has or that most people teach when they teach argumentation. Inductive and deductive reasoning. 
Inductive reasoning can best be understood with the simple phrase, bottom up. Deductive reasoning can best be understood with the simple phrase, top down. So in deductive reasoning, you start with something that you know is true, or it's as true as you can get, it's factually supported. And then you draw conclusions about what you're experiencing based on that assumption, fact, or principle. So <clears throat> a good one comes from archaeology, where the deductive claim or the archaeological truth is that the more wagons, wheel spokes you find on images of wagons in ancient cultures, the more advanced the culture is. So you go from a solid wheel to a four-spoked wheel to a six to an eight. That gives you an index of how advanced the culture is that you're dealing with. So if you find a new culture, you find an eight-spoked wagon wheel, you could assume they're probably pretty advanced. Now, that's an inductive piece of information, a, <clears throat> a local and small piece of information. Um, but you're drawing conclusions from, from deductive reasoning. Uh, inductive reasoning is bottom up. Now, this is where you find a lot of examples of something. Like, let's say you're an archaeologist again. I don't know why I'm thinking about archaeology today. I don't know why. Um, and let's say you're looking at a number of different um, examples of a kind of a clay pot and you're wondering what people used it for. In every single clay pot you find from this one dig site, there's rice in it, old rice, you know, fossilized or whatever. You might be able to conclude <clears throat> inductively with enough numbers, that's the trick with inductive reasoning, with enough examples, you can conclude that these were rice storing bowls. Now, there will be exceptions to that, but that doesn't invalidate the inductive reasoning. It takes a certain amount of numbers of something to invalidate the inductive claim. Now, most people would approach argumentation from deductive. They'd say, here are the rules. Here's what an argument's supposed to do. Here's what it's supposed to have in it. And when you violate those rules, you no longer have an argument. A great example of this is pragma dialectics, which we talked about in the last unit, where in pragma dialectic theory, there are 10 rules that must be followed or else you don't have a legitimate argument. Of course, you can keep fighting, but it wouldn't be a argument that one could ethically agree to or consent to or or even mark as an argument at the point where you violated one of these rules. Now, that's deductive. <clears throat> it's based upon a lot of inductive claims, a toolman and other, other scholars of argument, but it's still kind of a, a top-down approach. And like in philosophy, what it was was an argument's not an argument unless it has validity. That is, does it follow the philosophical rules of argumentation? So all argumentation was deductive at toolman's time because argumentation where he was was covered by the philosophers. In the United States in the 1950s, you have the birth or the slow, not the birth of, but the slow kind of teenage, tween age years of rhetoric. It's starting to get into its um, prime. Rhetoric professors and people who study oratory, and that comes with studying how to think, how to reason, how to make judgment. All of that is part of the study of rhetoric. Now, I'm a rhetorician. That's what my PhD is in, and that's how I approach argument. If this course was taught by a philosopher, It'd be very different. You have a very different set of uh, things to look at. You might look at Toulmin, but it might be to criticize him. Uh, I, I leave the door open to you about what you think about this, but the important thing about Toulmin's work and why I want you to read it is he's mapping arguments. He provides a structure. Now, notice this sentence is kind of important. A structured argument helps us understand how arguments work. He's not interested in saying, here's the right way to argue. Not at all. And that's where people, a lot of people misread Toulmin here. This, we have to be very careful with this because he's not saying this is how arguments work. If an argument doesn't have a warrant, it doesn't work. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying, you just probably haven't found the warrant if people believe it. So that's for people who already know where I'm going. But for you who haven't been there uh, yet, He's not saying this is how arguments should be. This is not prescriptive. This is descriptive, inductive, based on what he sees and researches people doing. Now, that's really interesting. Have you thought about, you know, in this class, your task is to come up with your own definition, understanding of argument. Have you thought about whether or not you're going to approach this like, here's what it should be, here's what we should try to conform to, or have you thought about, well, I want a more natural theory of argument. I want to do it based on what I hear people do on the internet. Now, that would be interesting. That would be much more of like what Toulmin's doing. If you're going to do it top down, you're, you're doing something more philosophical, closer to maybe what Chris Tinsdale is doing, where he's saying, 
rhetorical argument might be the way we ought to think about argument, the way this ought to be taught and done. And I mean, I agree with, with Tyndale quite a bit. I think that that book is amazing. That's why I signed it to you. I think it's a brilliant uh, theory of argument, and, but it's also prescriptive. It's also like maybe we should be moving this way. Maybe we should be teaching and thinking about argument this way. Toulmin's primarily inductive. He's like, how does argument work? It's like he's investigating. He's not saying how the human body should be. He's sort of dissecting arguments, looking at the organs and saying, here's what they do as far as I can tell. And that's always the issue with inductive um, arguments. As far as the examples that we have indicate, this is the truth. And so I guess I, I, guess I used archaeology because when you think about inductive, when you think about ancient civilizations, you really are kind of stuck in an inductive. There's nobody around from there to tell you how it was or to give you testimony. You have to let what you find communicate to you what must have been the case, what must be true. So how to understand how arguments work. All right, so let's go and look at some of Toulmin's own words, and I'll read it kind of with you, and we'll see where we go from, from there. Let's see. So I had you read uh, this section, section three, just a few pages of it, not too, too long. The whole book is great um, if you're like really into it or you're having trouble sleeping, I highly recommend it. Um, and here we are, the very first line of this chapter, an argument is like an organism. This is exactly what I'm saying. He's looking at it from the outside in and saying, okay, argument, you speak to me and tell me what you're about. So I want to go down to the part that I think is like, he's kind of going on and on and on. I mean, he is a philosopher, right? They really do like to prattle on, don't they? So he's talking about how argument, in these pages, how argument has always been a top-down affair where it's recognized by its structure and the structure makes an argument that's not necessarily the case. So let's read in <clears throat> distinction uh, some of the, the, he's pushing back on Aristotle, he's pushing back on classical philosophy here. He's like, legal utterances have many distinct functions. Statements of claim, evidence, and identification, testimony about events and dispute, interpretations of a statute, or discussions of its validity, claims to exemption from the application of a law, Pleas and extenuation, verdicts, sentences, all these different classes of proposition have their parts to play in the legal process, and the difference between them are in practice far from trifling. When we turn from the special case of the law to consider rational arguments in general, we are faced at once by the question of whether these must not be analyzed in terms of an equally complex set of categories. So he's saying, if we take a simple idea of, of philosophical validity to argument, it doesn't even begin to capture the way arguments happen in a court of law. We need a much more complex argumentation pattern than what is provided. He's going to provide that. Let it be, this is on page 90. Let it be supposed that we make an assertion and commit ourselves thereby to the claim which any assertion necessarily involves. I don't like this. Um, go away. Oh man, that's so much better. Can you guys actually see that or am I too, am I, my head too big? Teeny tiny professor. Ooh. Goodbye, goodbye. Wow, look how small I can get. This is kind of cool. Eh, I think this is good enough, right? Yeah, um, I could, I can just kind of disappear into the microcosm. And now I will examine atoms. <laughs> hey, I'm back. Okay, sorry. Anyway, enough goofing around. You guys have other stuff to do. <clears throat> Let it be supposed we make an assertion. <clears throat> and commit ourselves thereby to the claim which any assertion necessarily involves. If this claim is challenged, we must be able to establish it, that is, make it good, and show that it is justifiable. How is this to be done? <clears throat> Unless the assertion was made quite wildly and irresponsibly, we shall normally have some facts to which we can put in its support. If the claim is challenged, it is up to us to appeal to these facts and present them as the foundation upon which the claim is based. Okay, nothing strange here. This is kind of the way you probably assume argument works anyway. Um, of course, we may not get the challenger even agreed about the correctness of these facts. Whoop, 2020, anybody? And in this case, we have to clear his objection out of the way by a preliminary argument. Only when this prior issue or lemma, as geometers would call it, so he's referring to geometry because he assumes that'll be more familiar to you. He's writing to an audience that's not you. I'm sure geometry has a 
really important and huge place in your heart, something you absolutely love, but, I mean, probably not. He's talking to a whole other generation of people. Whenever people do this in writing, don't feel bad. They're not speaking. They can't assume who you are and where you are. You know, um, they're trying to reach the common people who would be reading the book at the time, something familiar to that audience. It's not your fault that you don't understand this. It's just that you're not part of the assumed audience for this author. It's, it's neither here nor there. It doesn't mean you're dumb or that you don't get it. It just means he's calling on a metaphor here that you just don't have the, uh, the access to because of your cultural situation. It doesn't mean anything except uh, he's writing to a, a, different, a different crew. But we can still understand it. We just have to work a little bit harder. Um, let's get down here. This is interesting. So, Harry's hair is not black, we assert. So that might be the assertion. What have we got to go on? That's the challenge. Like, how can you prove that? Our personal knowledge is that it is in fact red. That is our datum, the ground which we produce support for the original assertion. Peterson, we may say, will not be a Roman Catholic. Why? We base our claim on the knowledge that he's a Swede, which makes it very unlikely that he will be a Roman Catholic. Wilkinson, asserts the prosecutor in court, has committed an offense against the road traffic acts in support of this claim. Two policemen are prepared to testify. They timed him driving at 45 miles an hour in a built-up area. In each case, an original assertion is supported by the facts bearing on it. So, very standard Toolman saying, look, the way this works in real life is someone makes a claim first, and then the evidence comes out when someone says, well, what do you have to go on? Uh, what do you mean his hair is black? I think it's red. You say, well, I saw this, or I looked at this picture, or da 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 this kind of thing. Whatever the facts might be. So we already have, therefore, one distinction to start with between the claim or conclusion is merits we're seeking to establish, C, and the facts we appeal to as a foundation for the claim, what I shall refer to as our data, D. If our challenger's question is, what do you have to go on? Producing the data or the information may serve to answer him, but this is only one of the ways that we can be challenged. So he's saying argumentation is much, much more complex than fact, pr uh, proof, claim, which is the way the current media and our current environment want us to think about argument, isn't it? 1958. We haven't advanced very much, have we? Toolman's critique would still be valid of when you watch CNN or MSNBC or Fox. Just look at the facts. Just look at the facts. It's not that easy. In our court of law, normal operations at a courtroom show that it's incredibly complex, Toolman says. To understand what an argument is. Or to understand how an argument works. So, data and claim are two of the most important parts here in the model. But, even after, remember he said there's many more ways to be challenged than just your facts. Even after we've produced our data, we may find ourselves being asked further questions of another kind. We may now be required not to add more factual information than which we have already provided. Perhaps we've provided all the facts we have, or perhaps the the facts are, are not in dispute. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's true. But, but how does it prove your claim? The question is now, how do you get there? So these are two different questions that people can challenge people in arguments on. How do you, how, how do you figure? What have you got to go on? Which is very British, isn't it? What have you got to go on? I hope that accent isn't insulting British people. I've been told by Irish people that my British accent is pretty good. I don't know. That might actually be another layer of, I mean, there's a history there. So, um, but we would say, well, how can you prove it? Or, 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 okay, what are your facts? But let's say that's, that part is done. Well, what's the next place we can go? Okay, well, how do you get there? How does that data support the claim? This question is not about the step, but about the nature and justification of the step. Supposing we encounter this fresh challenge, we may bring we must bring forward no not further data. For about these, the same query may immediately be raised again, but propositions of rather different kind. Rules, principles, interference licenses, or what you will, instead of additional items of information. Our task is no longer to strengthen the ground on which our argument is constructed, but rather show that, taking these data as a starting point, the step to the original claim or conclusion is an appropriate and legitimate one. That means these facts are relevant and appropriate and the right ones to move to the claim. What are needed are general hypothetical statements which can act as bridges and authorize the sort of step which our particular argument commits us. 
They normally may be written very briefly in the form if D, then C. That's kind of like from formal logic or the way philosophers look at argumentation. But for candor's sake, candor meaning like a common speech, just the way people normally talk, they can profitably be expanded and made more explicit. Data such as D entitle one to draw conclusions or make claims such as C or alternatively, given data D, one may take it that C. Propositions of this kind I shall call warrants. This is what Toulmin is most famous for, the warrant. To distinguish them from both conclusions and data, these warrants will be observed to correspond to the practical standards or canons of argument referred to in our earlier essays. So he's meaning the first two sections of the book, which I didn't have you read. I feel like I could teach a whole class on this book, but it would be very hard because the writing is... Very dense. To pursue our previous examples, the knowledge that Harry's hair is red entitles us to set aside any suggestion that is black on account of the warrant. If anything is red, it will also not be black. Now, realize these aren't philosophically pure factual statements. These are things that are generally true, right? That's what a warrant, how a warrant is, or associations that we know from history or from our own practices. Remember, this is the way people argue. It's not the way they should argue for maximum 100% accuracy and factacity and scientific rigor on everything. That's not what Toulmin is interested in. He's trying to construct a philosophical structure to define how argument is by saying, this is what people do. This is how people argue. This is what they do. He's walking us through the steps people take when they're arguing about something. And then he's making it into these categories. I mean, it's really a, an amazing project if you think about it. He's thinking about how people argue in daily life and, and how to explain it as if you were explaining it to like an alien. Because we kind of know about the warrant, don't we? We kind of use that. We kind of know what that is. We use it all the time. Oh, the Jets are going to lose this weekend. Uh, well, how do you know? How do you, how do you get there? Oh, well, have you seen them play the last few weeks? So what's the warrant there? The way a football team has played previously will most likely be how they will play this week. That's a warrant. Warrants are these kind of statements. The very triviality of this warrant is connected to the fact that we are concerned here as much with counter-assertion as with an argument. So he's saying, look, we're, we're dealing with this as a living thing. This is like a, a batter you have to stir. This is a thing that's alive. We're not dealing with an argument as a a sterile kind of an artifact or a thing in a lab. We're dealing with it as it's done. The fact that Peterson is a Swede and directly relevant to the question of his religious denomination for, as we should probably put it, a Swede can be taken almost certainly not to be a Roman Catholic. The step involved here is not trivial, so the warrant is not self-authenticating. That means that's not 100% true, right? It's not 100% true that all Swedes are not Roman Catholics, but it is very likely that somebody from Sweden is not a Catholic because of the history there and um, the religious um, norms there. Likewise, in the third case, our warrant would be such statement as, a man who has proved to have driven more than 30 miles per hour in a built-up area can be found to have committed an offense against the Road Traffic Act. And that warrant might not be the actual speed limit in that neighborhood, but it's pretty much generally true that if you drive over 30 in a neighborhood or here in the city, if you drive over 30 or 35, you're getting a ticket. You have, you've broken the law. We kind of know that law, although we can go and look it up. And at the point where we look it up in the law, it becomes a fact, it becomes data, along with the timing. So there's not a lot of space for a warrant in there, but the warrant would be that he drove faster than you should in a place where it might not be posted. So that interpretation there leads us to the next paragraph. The question will at once be asked, how absolute is this distinction between data on the one hand and warrants on the other? Will it always be clear whether a man who challenges an assertion is calling for the production of his adversary's data or for the warrants authorizing his steps? So when someone says, I don't believe you, what are they What are they not in belief of? Is it the data? Is it your facts, research? Is it the warrant? Can one, in other words, draw a sharp distinction between the force of the two questions? What have you got to go on and how do you get there? By grammatical tests alone, the distinction may appear far from absolute. In the same English sentence may serve a double function. It may be uttered, that is, in one situation, to convey a piece of information and another to authorize a step in an argument, and even perhaps in some context to do both of these things at once. All these possibilities were illustrated before too long. Ha ha ha. The book goes on for several hundred more pages. Not too long? What do you mean? What have you got to go on? It's kind of long. He likes to talk. It's good because this is a fantastic book. 
I encourage you reading more about it if you're interested in Toolman's theory because there's a lot to it. The only thing I want you to think about is the warrant and the role the warrant plays. That's a very important part of this because it's just so essential in the study of argumentation. You can't get away from it. You can't get away from the warrant. For the moment, the important thing is not to be too cut and dried in our treatment of the subject, nor to commit ourselves in advance to a rigid terminology. At any rate, we shall find it possible in some situations to distinguish clearly two different logical functions. And the nature of this distinction is hinted at if one contrasts the two sentences, whenever A, one has found that B, and whenever A, one may take it that B. Now that's the difference between a fact or data and a warrant. I think that's a very good distinction. And most of the time we're arguing this second sentence, aren't we? Whenever A, one may take it that B. Oh, you have Professor Yano. You can blow that class off. He's so easy. Now, is that true? No, I mean, you can still fail. But is it likely? Well, you can take it that the class will be easier than most classes. Now, this is how people argue. They don't argue in terms of facts, rigid logic, and things like that. Now, here's the line that people forget, all you people out there watching this who might just be interested in debate or argumentation. Here's where you screw up when you teach this stuff. We now have the terms we need to compose the first skeleton of a pattern for analyzing... Wait, what? For analyzing, argu analyzing arguments. Yes, analyzing arguments. Not creating them. Not determining if they are arguments or not, but analyzing them. Why are we why are we trying to teach students how to write arguments by saying, where's your warrant? Compose a warrant. It doesn't work like that. The warrant comes from society. It comes from what we understand things to be. So a lot of people are out there teaching like, okay, write the warrant for that argument. Here's your data. Here's your claim. What's the warrant? I mean, let them argue it out and we'll see. But this is for the P, this is for when you're critiquing an argument and and when you're commenting on an argument that's where the warrant comes in is a piece of analysis and here's the first time that somebody drew this now famous analytical frame data so claim since w harry was born in bermuda so harry is a british subject since a man born in bermuda will be a british subject there you go. Harry was born in the Bronx. So Harry is an American because someone born in the United States will be a U.S. citizen. I mean, unless President Trump changes this. He was threatening to change this not too long ago. So this is the, um, it goes on a little bit more, but one of the things he talks about a bit that I want to talk about here to cl close this lecture is field of argument. Toulmin's contribution to the creation of arguments is the idea of argument fields, which is don't look for universal evidence or universal kinds of claims or proof uh, or things like that when you are trying to uh, create arguments. Everything depends on argument fields, which has something to do with who the people are, where they're from, what expertise they have, things like that. For example, arguments and assumptions about truth and fact and reality differ greatly between people from New York and people from Texas. You kind of have to know that those arguments won't work the same because they're field dependent. A group of uh, priests are not going to look at arguments the same way as a group of physicians. You can't use the same things and say, well, logic, OMG logic. No, it doesn't work like that. You have to craft your argument to the field that it's in. Arguments make sense based on the field they're in. You can't universalize that. And you see the struggle with that when people are trying to use science to claim for global warming and trying to use science to claim for things like vaccinations. They're not doing their due diligence and adapting it for the field that they're presenting it to. Now, the defense from virologists and physicians and scientists is science is true. We don't adapt. They should adapt. Okay, uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. If you're, in, if you're a doctor and, and, and you're working as a physician and you're working in virology and you're working in things like vaccinations and public health advice and things like global warming and policy advice on CO2 emissions and pollution, you should try to make that argument stick by using whatever you can to get it across to people. But the attitude now is, no, you bend. Logic and truth don't bend. And Toulmin was absolutely against, remember, this is 1958, 
absolutely against that kind of hardcore approach that read to him as the failure of philosophy to prevent fascism, to prevent the Nazis from taking control and, and destroying the lives of millions, countless of millions of people across Europe and across the world. That, that should hit heavy. This idea that we're still back on this like, no, you change. I don't have to change my argument because it's true. I have the facts. Toulmin would say, what's the field here? How do, how do we adapt what we're saying for the field to work to make sure we have the ability to get our idea across to where it could be challenged in terms of datum, in terms of warrant? Um, how do we get to that? We're still struggling with this. Well, I'm not going to argue with you. You don't have the facts. Okay. Fine. Be stupid. Is that really what we want argumentation to be like? Is that what we want democracy to be like? These are big, heavy questions. And I think that um, when we go back to our um, document here, the conclusions uh, about Toulmin that you might want to think about is, is the warrant a good way to think about argument? Let me, let me define the warrant real quick before we get out of this video. I know it's already half an hour, and I always promise not to make longer than 30-minute videos, but the way to think about the warrant is it's a kind of an adhesive, and it's sticking information to a belief. A claim is a belief, so it's stuck together. If you have any hope of getting that information unstuck, you're like, okay, that claim should not be stuck to that information. That's a mistake. That information might be good information, but this person's reasoning incorrectly or the information's bad or whatever, the best way to challenge it is to figure out what that glue is in the middle. What's the warrant? What's the adhesive? Holding those two things together. What's that adhesive? Then you know what kind of solvent to use to take it apart. So a warrant might be a belief like, I say, oh, the Jets are going to lose this week. Why? Well, the Jets have played badly every time. It's like, well, you're assuming that they haven't made any changes on the team, but they've changed this player, this player, this player. Now, that might be a way to move apart and make less sticky the claim that the, the Jets are going to lose from the data that they've lost their previous games or they are the Jets or something like that, right? Now I have some space to operate and I can challenge that argument based on the warrant alone. And that's the way people argue in reality, according to Toolman. They don't argue based on logic, facts, proof, absolute science will win everything. You must bow to science. These things are not persuasive. They don't move people. They don't change things. All it does is make people angry or, or make people double down on the beliefs they already have. That's not the point of argument. Argument isn't to um, certify. I mean, it can be, but it's kind of a sad use for argument, isn't it? To double down and, and certify and solidify the things you already believe? Eh, not for me. So what's a good way? Is the warrant a good way to think about argument? Another one is what's a good inductive argument model for today? You might think about that in your final paper. Um, and think about the way Toulmin is talking about argument. Does this resonate with you? Do you think this is a good idea? Do you think Toulmin is smart? These are all things you can do in your in your response to um, to this unit. So I hope you enjoyed our little walk through uh, Toulmin's uses of argument. Of course, there's a lot more to say on Toulmin. I just want to keep the videos about half an hour for class. Um, I might go through uses of argument maybe and kind of read through it and maybe go chapter by chapter and kind of do a read through like I kind of did in this video, but that'll be something that will take a long time to produce. So it'll take a while and um, it's kind of a busy time. So I might not make all those videos immediately, but I hope you enjoyed this video. Please leave a comment or question in the comments here on YouTube, like comment, subscribe, hit the little bell. If you want to be notified every time I post a new video, again, these videos are meant for a college class that's being taught online, but you can still learn from them. And if you're in my class, hit me up on the dizzy. I was trying to call it the cord, but Discord apparently is called the Dizzy. So hit me up on the Dizzy with your questions and comments, and I will respond. I hope this was helpful in understanding the reading from Stephen Toolman's uses of argument for Unit 2 of the argumentation course here at St. John's University, Fall 2020. Oh, yeah.